Hi, I'm Rodney Donahue, and today I'm going to talk with you about some of the worst episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 2. It will be a dress uniform dinner, gentlemen. I already talked about The Child, Unnatural Selection, and Shades of Grey, and today we're going to finish our series by talking about Up the Long Ladder and Manhunt. So we're going to start by talking about Up the Long Ladder, another three-storyline episode. So what happens in Up the Long Ladder? Well, in Up the Long Ladder, story one follows Worf getting the measles and drinking a deadly tea with Dr. Pulaski. In story number two, an Irish colony takes up residence in the cargo bay. Would you happen to be married? No, why? No. Uh, well, uh... And in story number three, a society of clones perform nightmarish procedures on Riker and Pulaski and eventually get the real genetic material that they need from the Irish living in the cargo bay. So why does this episode occur? In all your travels, have you heard anything from the other colony? I guess the point of this episode is to bring together the two groups that left Earth. Other than that, I don't really know what the point is. That the Enterprise crew like their individuality? You want to clone us? There are much better episodes of TNG that show that, they, that people like their individuality. Episodes like Family. <laughs> they took everything I was. Or Second Chances. I have found that humans value their uniqueness. That sense that they are different from everyone else. Why is this episode one of the worst? Oh, all kinds of reasons. Dr. Pulaski, how is Lieutenant Worf? Uh, Worf was um, just observing a Klingon ritual involving fasting. And he didn't take into account... The Klingon measles and tea ceremony story takes up much of the first part of the episode, is resolved, and does not affect the rest of the episode in any way. I almost feel as though this storyboard moment could have existed in any other episode of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2. Access chickens, pigs, a device used for spinning yarn. There's a horrible moment where Data and Picard talk at the same time. Or a thread, which consists of a large hand or foot driven wheel and one spindle. How would anyone carry such an insane a mix thin of rounded cargo. tapering rod? Data. There's a funny moment where the Enterprise comes out of warp and almost hits a celestial body. There's a very strange shot that begins mid transport and from behind the individuals transporting. I don't mind the 80s horror music and the big needle. But I am troubled by the fact that Riker, Pulaski, and Geordi beam back down to the Clone Society without any kind of security. Where are you going? To their cloning lab. But I know why they did it. It's because Riker discovers his clone and vaporizes him, and then he gets consent from Pulaski, a doctor in the 24th century, to vaporize her clone as well. Did they not bring Worf along because he'd pull an Odo and arrest them for murder? Killing your own clone is still murder. In Deep Space Nine's episode A Man Alone, Odo hunts down Ibudan for murdering his own Ibudan clone. Ibudan has been turned over to the Bajoran authorities just hours after his clone gained consciousness and began a new life. No wonder Riker and Pulaski did not want to bring Worf down with them. I know the Mariposan culture seems alien, even frightening, but really we do have much in common. They're human beings fighting for survival. Would we do any less? There will be no justice served here today. What is the worst moment of Up the Long Ladder? 
The worst moment is when Pulaski exclaims that the clones and the Irish are a match made in heaven. This does not solve the problem so much as it solves the episode. I I don't think that there was going to be any other resolution, because I also wonder why they can't contact Starfleet. Pulaski says that they have two to three generations or 50 years. That doesn't seem like enough time to contact Starfleet or the Federation Council to find an actual solution to this problem other than putting these 21st or 22nd century colonists back together and ending the episode as quickly as possible? It's a match made in heaven. Does this episode have any redeeming qualities? It actually does. And what are you staring at? You've never seen a woman before. I thought I had. Brynna O'Dell is a commanding presence. You don't offer us a bite or a sup, and when we build a fire to cook a little something, the whole place goes mad. She expresses frustration with Picard, and she scolds Riker, and then Worf offers her a job. Madam, have you ever considered a career in security? If it's anything like babysitting, I'm an authority. Why does Worf offer Odell a Klingon drink? He seems more diplomatic than usual in this episode. This is the second beverage that he's offered someone in this episode. Sir, I think I'll stay and give her some help. Uh, Riker volunteers to help Brynna uh, because she's attractive, and he does so by staring at her as she works. That isn't necessary. The ship will clean itself. Well, good for the bloody ship. At the very beginning, Worf falls down. I wonder why Dr. Pulaski doesn't recommend a chair at tactical. It's obvious that he probably was locking his knees while he was standing. Everyone else on the bridge gets a chair, so why shouldn't Worf have one as well? I will say that the best part about Up the Long Ladder is that there is zero Data Pulaski interaction. Forgive me, I just can't think of another word that applies. It's almost like the writers of The Next Generation understand that Pulaski hates Data and she shouldn't be around him. Hold that thought. You'd think so, but then she shows up in peak performance and says the exact kind of crap that she'd been saying the whole season. Counselor Troy is going to need the comfort of a human touch and not the cold hand of technology. Manhunt has the opposite problem of Up the Long Ladder, where Up the Long Ladder and The Child both have way too much going on. Manhunt has very little going on, and almost nothing is at stake in this episode. So other than nothing, what happens in Manhunt? In Manhunt, Loxana Troy pursues Picard, Riker, and a hologram named Rex. And when she fails at all three, she exposes an Antedian terrorist plot. Why are they still here? Oh, they're not delegates. Those two are assassins. That's everything that happens in the episode. That is an outrage. So why does Manhunt occur in the grand scheme of TNG? My mother is beginning a physiological phase. It's one that all Betazoid women must deal with as they enter midlife. Manhunt is written like a sitcom. Uh, that needed some serious quality control. I think the theme of the episode involves not judging a book by its cover. Is this how you felt when you first saw me? Uh, It's what's on the inside that counts, that kind of thing. Judging a being by its physical appearance is the last major human prejudice, Wesley. But this idea is so scant throughout that it, it it just has to be about playing up the humor as Loxana 
pursues her various potential suitors. I know what you're thinking, Captain. You do? There's irony as Worf calls the Antedians a handsome race, and then they turn out to be uh, some of the deadliest guests that the Enterprise has allowed aboard, but this irony falls flat because there's so little going on in this episode. Computer, this isn't what I wanted at all. Why is Manhunt one of the worst episodes of TNG? Well, Manhunt has three major issues, stakes, shots, and stalling. The travesty is that all of these items are easily fixed. So after each of them, I'm going to uh, diagnose the problem and then I'm going to fix each of the issues. And I'm gonna play a little bit as Manhunt Mechanic. Your thoughts, they're primal, savage. In Manhunt, there's not really anything to care about at all. In fact, the only thing in the episode at stake are Loxana's feelings. A Betazoid woman in the face would be shocked and deeply resentful should you spurn any such advances. She would take it personally. Now this would be an interesting episode if Betazoids could control minds rather than just read them. But since Picard is a human being with free will who can say no, there's no real problem in this episode. In fact, the end of the episode is almost shocking because Loxana just has a throwaway line that the Antedians plan to blow up the conference. Well, of course you are. They were planning on blowing up the entire conference. Now, this could have very easily been fixed at the beginning of the episode by having a scene where Picard and Riker are talking about a threat to the conference. And if Picard and Riker and Worf are all trying to solve this problem and learn who's going to be at the conference, and then Troy starts making advances on them, and her advances are getting in the way of their security preparations, then we could have stakes that rise throughout the episode. No. As Loxana's interactions grow more and more cumbersome to the crew, then the stakes of finding these assassins grow as well. Loxana could even earlier in the episode have a line to Mr. Hom where she tells him that she knows the Antedians are assassins. And so she asks, you know, to stay away from them. And she knows, and we know the Antedians are assassins, and we have to see how Picard and Worf and Riker are going to figure this out over the course of the episode. And if inevitably they can't, then Troy can tell them. We thought since you were going to the same conference, you might like to beam down with the other delegates. Oh, they're not delegates. Those two are assassins. That would be a much more exciting way to bring about this episode. But instead, we're stuck in a sitcom. I was not expecting this, uh, this setting. This episode has one of the oddest master shots in TNG. It's a, it's a long shot that shows uh, Picard and locks on his entire bodies. The only reason that this shot exists is so we can see Loxana play footsie with Picard, and so we can see Picard bring his foot back. But this was the only camera setup with both actors that they had. They didn't take another one. Normally, the master shot would show a medium shot of individuals from above the table. And if we wanted to see Troy and Picard play footsie, we would have a close-up of their legs, and then we'd have a close-up shot to Loxana Troy's face showing what she's feeling and Picard's face expressing his uncomfortable, his awkwardness with the situation. That's how a normal scene would go. But Manhunt doesn't have much normal about it. So glad you could come. Manhunt also has a very serious time-wasting problem. Because if we're going to Rex's bar, you're gonna need it. About halfway through the episode, 
Picard decides to hide in the holodeck until they get to the conference. So, so during the first 20 minutes of the episode, uh, the creators were wasting our time, but now they're wasting our time and they're telling us that they're wasting our time. Uh, Picard hides on the holodeck and plays Dixon Hill, but he doesn't, he doesn't really want to play Dixon Hill. The flexibility of the program is limited to the parameters of the Dixon Hill novels. A bad guy pulls a gun and Picard stops it. Computer, this isn't what I wanted at all. Picard prevents the episode from getting too exciting. More ambiance, less substance. Picard heads to Rex's bar, another meaningless, stakes-free location in Manhunt. Eventually, Loxana Troy is just looking for potential mates, checking out both Worf and Wesley. Riker decides to head to the holodeck to tell Picard personally that the Antedians have awakened, and at this point, Data stops him and asks him to wait five minutes so Data can change into holodeck attire. Could you postpone our departure for just five minutes, sir? No problem. Why are these things happening? Your friends have time for one drink, haven't they, Dix? Oh, yes, of course. One more round. <laughs> the ultimate example of stalling occurs when a holographic character asks Picard if instead of leaving... Riker and Data can wait five minutes and have a drink. So what is the worst moment in Manhunt? It's got to be when Patrick Stewart calls Troy Diana. I tell you, Diana. Does Manhunt have any redeeming qualities? I have to admit... I actually enjoyed watching Manhunt. Now, again, I was, I was taking notes, so I don't know if I liked it more because I wanted to see how much could, how, how little could happen with nothing at stake, or if I was actually enjoying it. I will say that prior to this viewing, I have never enjoyed watching Manhunt. So, so this is a first for me. This is probably just my eighth viewing of Manhunt, and I've never liked it, but I, I think this time I liked it. You are the early favorite. Congratulations, sir. So uh, I'm going to talk about some fun moments that happened in this episode where nothing is really at stake. Uh, Picard brilliantly, brilliantly contacts Data to discuss different societies' rituals for giving thanks. And Data saves Picard from his date with Loxana. Multiplying it by nine to the third power. Picard exaggerates about Data and acts enthralled by Data's analysis. It's a great Patrick Stewart moment in an episode where nothing else is going on. I love how Mr. Hom indicates Geordi. I'm not a big costume guy, but I love when Loxana Troy dresses like a birthday party. So the next time you watch Manhunt, understand that the episode could have easily been fixed with one more master shot, with uh, instead of wasting our time through the whole episode by going to all these uh, unnecessary locations, they could have simply shot scenes with Worf and Picard and Riker making security preparations for this conference. Oh. Oh. And I'm glad we were able to end on a fun note, because even though the child, up the long ladder, manhunt, shades of gray, and unnatural selection are the worst episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, no. I'm still going to watch them all again. I'm still going to watch them probably every year. And so... So these episodes, even though they aren't very good, they're still fun to watch. And there are still things that you can find fun in them. I mean, except for unnatural selection. So I want to leave you with the idea that, yes, these episodes are terrible. Okay, Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2 has some of the worst episodes of all of Star Trek. 
I think if I were to do this, you know, looking, looking from top to bottom, yes, unnatural selection was in my worst of Trek, and that is still the worst of season two. I think right above that is Shades of Grey, only because Shades of Grey has a great three-minute clip of Data and Riker from Encounter at Farpoint. But I'd rather watch that than any three minutes in Unnatural Selection. Marvelous. Probably at the top of this list is Manhunt. I don't think I would have included Manhunt uh, as, as the number five worst episode of season two, but now I do. I would say Manhunt, Up the Long Ladder, The Child, Shades of Grey, and Unnatural Selection. And at this point, the second co-orbital satellite avoids a collision with the first. So that's the worst of season two. Season two is uh, up and down. There are some bright spots. Emissary is one of my top five episodes. I can't wait to talk about my top ten episodes when I know Contagion is going to be on the list. Uh, a lot of the other episodes are middle of the road. But these are definitely some of the worst episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation in season two. But even though they're the worst... There are some bright spots in all of them. If nothing else, I can still laugh at unnatural selection when the old lady talks about her birthday. I celebrated my 35th birthday a week ago. Felicitations. So that's the worst of season two. But I know why they did it. It's because Riker discovers his clone and vaporizes him, and then he gets consent from Pulaski, a doctor in the 24th century. In my other deliveries, except for a couple, the father was always present. 